and he wanted to see what would happen when the alpha particles hit the gold. He didn't expect very much would happen. He thought most of the alpha particles would carry straight on through without being deflected, without being bent through any large angle. But what happened? Well, he found something completely different. He said it was as surprising as if you shot a 15-inch artillery shell at a piece of tissue paper and had the artillery shell bounce back at you. Some of these alpha particles bounce straight back off the gold foil. So the only way this could happen is if inside the atom is a very small, dense concentration of matter. It's not spread out like the plum pudding. And Rutherford called this small, dense concentration the nucleus. What we're doing here at Fermilab is the descendant of that experiment. We take a beam of protons and collide it with a beam of antiprotons to see what the protons are made of. Thanks to Rutherford's discovery, scientists now knew that the structure of the atom included protons, electrons, and a nucleus. But it was up to James Chadwick, a student of Rutherford's, to complete the picture with the discovery of the neutron. So we're, we're standing now inside the D0 detector, which is one of the particle detectors in the Fermilab Collider. That pipe there is where the protons and antiprotons actually circulate. And they come into collision a few feet to your right. Uh, and all of this instrumentation around it is the equipment that we use to detect the results of those collisions, which kind of takes us back to the history of, of the neutron. Chadwick was able to carry out an experiment that showed that what the nucleus was made of was protons and neutrons. And what Chadwick used was a clever detection technique, which is what we're standing in the middle of to do that. So he didn't build a big piece of apparatus like this. He used paraffin wax. Like from a candle. Like from a candle. And what Chadwick did was to use this wax to intercept those particles that came out of the radioactive process. And then suddenly all the pieces fit into place. The discovery of the neutron changed history. In 1939, a group of scientists led by physicist Enrico Fermi used the neutron as a bullet to split the atom, giving birth to the nuclear age. Fermilab is home to one of the largest particle accelerators in the world, a four and a half mile long underground ring where subatomic particles are accelerated to nearly the speed of light and then smashed into each other. To accomplish this feat requires the help of our next great discovery, the superconductor. Who discovered superconductivity? Why was it such a big deal? Well, it was way back before the First World War, I think 1909, something like that. A Dutch physicist called Heke Kameling Onnes was the first guy to figure out how to turn helium from a gas into a liquid. And once he'd figured out how to do that, he could use liquid helium as a refrigerator fluid to make other materials very cold. And he wanted to study the properties of materials at very low temperatures. And one of the things that people were interested in at that time is how does the electrical resistance of a metal, for example, depend on temperature? Does it rise? Maybe it, it gets very resistive at low temperatures. That was one idea. So Onis took a sample of mercury, which he could make very pure, and he put it in an apparatus kind of like this one. He just dipped it in liquid helium in a refrigerator vessel and measured its electrical resistance as he lowered the temperature. And what he found was that as you lowered the temperature, the resistance went, went down fairly smoothly. And then suddenly, when he got to 4.2 degrees above absolute zero, the resistance dropped to nothing, absolutely to zero. This mercury would conduct electricity with no resistance, without losing any energy, without dissipating the current at all. And that was what he called superconductivity. So to see some superconductors at work, Bill, we're going down into this tunnel about 30 feet below the prairie in Illinois. And this is the Fermilab accelerator tunnel. In this tunnel, we have uh, a large ring of superconducting magnets which we use to accelerate and contain protons and antiprotons that we're using to study the properties of matter. It's a big tunnel, four miles long, so we've arranged a little transportation for you. Oh, it's lovely. Beautiful, isn't it? It is. So we're using superconductors here. Superconductors allow an electric current to flow without losing any energy and we can use them to generate a strong magnetic field, and that's what we're doing here. These are magnets, so we use the magnets to keep the protons and antiprotons circulating in the Tevatron, going round and round this big ring. They travel at close to the speed of light. It's 186,000 miles per second faster than we're going. Kind of <laughs> exhilarating to do that speed in this car. I would um, feel massive. Though. That's right. The particle accelerator at Fermilab requires enormous power. 
It costs more than a million dollars worth of electricity every month to refrigerate the lab superconductors to minus 455 degrees Fahrenheit, the point where electricity flows with zero resistance. The technical challenge now is to find superconductors that work at much higher temperatures at a much lower cost. Starting back in the 1980s, a couple of researchers at IBM in Switzerland found a class of materials that uh, superconduct is about 100 degrees warmer in temperature than this kind of device. Now, 100 degrees above absolute zero is still not the kind of temperatures that you have in your refrigerator. Of course, the holy grail is to find a material that's a superconductor at room temperature, because that kind of thing, if it could be made into useful electrical conductors, would really revolutionize the world. All of the things in your house that use electric current or that use electric motors would be changed and made much more efficient by that. Our next discovery takes us on the quest to find the smallest pieces of matter in the universe. First, the electron was discovered, then the proton, and finally, the neutron. Science now had a new model of the atom, the tiny building blocks that make up all matter. And once accelerators were developed that could slam subatomic particles together at nearly the speed of light, dozens of new particles broke away in the process and were discovered. So many, in fact, Physicists began to refer to them as the particle zoo. In the late 40s and early 50s, when the discovery of so-called strange particles began, uh, I got very interested in that. But it was an offbeat field. Uh, one wasn't encouraged to work on that. American physicist Murray Gell-Mann began to see patterns in the bewildering array of all the new members of the particle zoo. He used common characteristics to divide particles into different families. In the process, he isolated the smallest components of the atom's nucleus, the very pieces that protons and neutrons are built from. As a theoretician, I couldn't, I suppose, really discover new things, but I could uh, propose them. And uh, if they turned out to be right, uh, you could call it a discovery in a sense. What I did was to propose that the neutron and proton were not elementary, as everybody thought, but were uh, composed instead of uh, smaller particles called quarks with some very bizarre properties. Gell-Mann's quarks did for subatomic particles what the periodic table did for the chemical elements. And in 1969, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. His classification of the tiniest bits of matter brought order to the chaos of the particle zoo. I thought that uh, the sound, quark, was a good sound for these fundamental constituents. It sounds like a good name for the fundamental constituents of neutrons and protons, mesons, quark. But I didn't know how to spell it. I thought maybe K-W-O-R-K. But then uh, perusing James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, as I do once in a while, uh, I uh, noticed this, the line, three quarks for Muster Mark. And I thought, three? After all, that's a very important number for quarks. <laughs> and uh, Maybe I should spell it Q-U-A-R-K. While Gelman believed quarks to be real, he never expected anyone to find one. Some of the earliest evidence that the quark idea was correct came from uh, experiments by friends of mine at the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator in which uh, electrons were scattered off protons. And essentially what they were doing was taking an electron microscope picture of the proton. And sure enough, there were the three quarks. <laughs> Our search for answers to the questions about the universe around us have taken us from the submicroscopic scale of atoms and quarks to the farthest reaches of the galaxy and beyond. Our last greatest discovery is actually the result of centuries of effort by countless men and women of science. Since the discoveries of Isaac Newton and Michael Faraday, Scientists believe there were but two basic forces of nature. But in the 20th century, 
Scientists discovered there were two more at work.